Hi. Many years ago, Charles Schultz in his Peanuts comic strip, I don't know if any of you have read the comics anymore, but Schultz, speak softly but carry a beagle. I had a beagle hound. I've had two beagle hounds in my lifetime. They're great with kids, but when my last one died, I said, I don't want another dog. So anyway, speak softly but carry a big stick. Roosevelt applied this largely to Latin America. And he reserved the right to intervene. He got a doctrine called the Roosevelt Corollary. Maybe if you study geometry, you've run into this word corollary. It's where you have a, something that you've proven, but then you attach something else to what's been proven. Well, Roosevelt's uh, used the Monroe Doctrine, but said that the Monroe Doctrine meant that if any Latin American country got out of hand, the United States could come in and settle the dispute in that country that got out of hand. In other words, basically the United States had the right to intervene in any Latin American country that it felt like was doing wrong, which basically meant what if some Latin American country was doing things that hurt American business, the United States was going to intervene and put out that dictator or put down that dictator. And the United States has intervened in Latin America many, many a time over. Ronald Reagan sent troops to Granada. Ronald Reagan went into Panama and captured <coughs> the Panamanian leader Noriega and put him in an American prison. I mean, the man was trafficking drugs now. I mean, that they convicted him of. Uh, whether the United States had a right to do that or not, that's, that's kind of debatable, academic. But the United States, every once in a while, would go in and intervene in these countries. Um, Roosevelt Corollary. Now, Roosevelt used an approach called the big stick in dealing with Latin America. The next man after him, Taft, was to use dollar diplomacy. In other words, Taft was waived dollars. Yeah, D-O-L-L-A-R. In other words, try to get his way in Latin America using American money. Roosevelt would use troops. But eventually what this led to is Franklin Roosevelt tried to be a good neighbor. He practiced what's called a good neighbor policy. And maybe for good cause, because when World War II broke out, the Latin American countries stayed out of it. World War I, the same way, the Latin American countries largely left it alone. <coughs> thanks in large part to Woodrow Wilson, who uh, had a different policy. And in the case of World War II now, those of you from Latin America may tell me, hey, but our country declared war on Germany. Yeah. When the war was about over, it was obvious that Germany was going to lose. All the Latin American nations at once declared war on Germany. It might say it's a case of piling on. But uh, yeah, nevertheless, but at least they, did not side with Germany, which could have been bad for the United States. Now, in the Far East, Japan. Japan was fighting a war with Russia. The Japanese were strongly asserting themselves. Well, Roosevelt, uh, first of all, the United States passed a law that said no more Japanese immigrants were to be allowed to come into the country. This upset the Japanese. So Roosevelt would have sat down, negotiated with the Japanese ambassador, and convinced the Japanese that they could voluntarily restrict immigration. He got the law that, that forbade immigration repealed, with the understanding that the Japanese would, yeah, some immigrants were allowed to come over, but they would be voluntarily restricted. Now, folk, of course, you all know, eventually we, had, we fought a war with Japan. And when we did, Japanese were rounded up and put in camps. We'll talk more about that later, whether or not it was justified or not, good or bad. But the Japanese were put in, the, in camps, but the camps were not anything like concentration camps. The Japanese there were at least fed and housed and received medical care, which was not the case of Europe of Hitler's concentration camps. Now, um, Japanese, but pardon me, President Roosevelt sent the Great White Fleet, a large fleet of American ships around the world on a piece, got a tour, what he called a tour of goodwill to display American might, among other things. And 
They showed off the Japanese how strong America was. And during his administration, the United States and Japan remained largely at peace. But tensions were to mount. And them tensions mounted until eventually it led to a war with Japan. Now, in the meantime, France and Germany got into a dispute in the early 1900s. Roosevelt stepped in and mediated the dispute. Germany felt like if they had been, if they had wanted to, they could have easily crushed France. But, all right, France had lost a big war to Germany in 1871. And Germany was bullying its way through France again, trying to, con to get its way. In. But the dispute was over Morocco. The French had it, and the Germans had a claim to it also. Thanks to Roosevelt, Germany backed down. But this was to alienate Germany. And eventually, as you know, we were to fight two wars with Germany. So some of these efforts at peace. Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation of the dispute. But some of these efforts at peace wind up in the long run doing more harm than good. Um, but he developed a reputation as a major player in world politics, which every president since has been expected to do, become a major player in world politics. Now, Germany, Japan, okay, Panama. Panama is a narrow country that joins North and South America. When Roosevelt became president, Panama was owned by Colombia. Colombia right next door. Roosevelt sent ambassadors to Colombia to try to suggest to Colombia, hey, we'll give you $10 million if you let us build a canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Colombia refused. In the meantime, a bunch of Panamanians said, hey, this is short, so we need this canal. This canal can make us rich too. I mean, when you take folk, you can see on the map, without the Panama Canal, a ship had to go all the way around South America. That was a really long journey. Well, the Panama Canal would join the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Roosevelt encouraged the um, Panamanians to revolt. And within 24 hours after Panama had revolted, Roosevelt recognized the Panamanian government as legitimate and told Colombia, if you send troops in, we're going to fight on the side of Panama. Panama felt, Colombia felt cheated. Years later, the United States, feeling a guilt of conscience, paid Colombia $25 million for the taking of the canal. But Roosevelt himself didn't pay anything. He bragged, I took Panama. Now, the Panama Canal, unlike the Suez Canal, which is a wide, deep ditch, the Suez Canal joins the Mediterranean world to the Red Sea and greatly reduces the amount of time it takes a ship that doesn't have to go around Africa to get the Far East. The Panama Canal joins the Atlantic, the Pacific. But the Suez Canal was just a wide, deep ditch. The Panama Canal had to go over mountains. So basically to do that, you had to have a lock. So you'd have a ship here. <coughs> the ship would come to here. They cleared away an area here. Then they would lock the ship in here, raise the water level. They get to the next lock. They'd raise the water level, close off this door and raise the water level so on and so forth, so the ship would get to here, then they'd do the same thing coming down, the ship would get into a lock, they would load, the ship would come here, they'd lower the water level, let the ship down, and so on and so forth, until, by a series of interlocks, or a series of locks, the ship would get over mountaintop, and then get to the Pacific Ocean below, or cross start of the Pacific, and get to the Atlantic Ocean. These locks still exist, except today they're bigger than they were. The Panama Canal is bigger than it was. But the Panama Canal, uh, the United States got a 99-year lease on Panama, but Panama drove us out in the 1970s when Jimmy Carter was president. Jimmy Carter, one of the things that he did was negotiate a new treaty that gave the Panama Canal to Panama. Whether he should have or not, one senator said after he voted that if he knew what he knew now, he would not have voted the way he did. But nevertheless, the treaty was ratified and Panama got the canal 25 years earlier than the treaty called for. All right. Um,
He was the first president in history to mediate a labor dispute. Today, presidents don't do that because, let's face it, the strike is somewhat obsolete. The union workers are few and far between anymore. Unskilled labor is almost a thing of the past. The blue collar worker, yeah, still exists, but not, not in the same way that he did. But, so, uh, but when I was a kid, big strikes would really hurt. I mean, we'd go to the supermarket and find that the shelves were bare and empty and products were hard to get. Even sometimes gasoline would be a scarce commodity because of a strike. And uh, remember one time President Eisenhower, after the strike lasted 100 days, he said, I'm going to settle it. And he went in and settled. I did not know what a strike was at the time. I was just a kid. But all I knew was a strike was really, really bad and almost like a war. But anyway, um, today with workers are not as likely to use a strike as they once were, even though so they still go on, particularly teachers. All right. This week was supposed to be a strike week for students to strike against education. The issue will be one. Many of you heard about it. Not one of you. Uh, you're all supposed to go on strike this week. Nobody heard about it. Good enough. Over the issue of global warming. Oh yes. Stop attending classes. Yeah. Oh yeah. None of you heard about it. I was anxious to see, did anybody know? Maybe the ones of you who know about it didn't show up. But I don't know. All right, now some of you, your classmates told me last week they wouldn't be here. All right, now, Roosevelt, when, he, uh, when his term was up, and he served seven years. He served three years of from McKinley, he was McKinley's vice, then he served four years of his own right. He was reelected, and he was a young man, but after it was over, he said, I had no idea the office would take such a toll. The late nights, the hard work, the foreign ambassadors visiting, the, all the paperwork that had to be done, and all the other stuff that goes along with being president. He said, I had no, but anyway, he turned it over to his successor, William Howard Taft. He believed that Taft was the best man for the job, so he got Taft nominated by the Republican Party. Taft won the election. The Democrats ran Bryan again. The people still did not want Bryan. Anyway, uh, Taft. Now, Taft's wife was just overjoyed. She thought this would be a really good chance for me to show up and for me to shine as first lady. Unfortunately, she had a stroke early in his administration, which she slowly recovered from, but it took a lot of her time as First Lady was spent flat on a sick bed. But Taft's mother said to him, this office of president is an office for a man who can stand up and fight and debate. And she said, you're no good at fight and you're no good at debate. And basically, she proved to be right. Roosevelt told Taft when he left office, don't you tackle the tariff issue. The tariff issue is a big issue and I've left it alone. Well, the fact of the matter was, tariffs, the tariff issue has been an issue all the way from Washington to Trump. And we still don't, but the world was heading toward lower tariffs. And because the United States was at this point in the biggest Economic, economy in the world, a lot of people from abroad wanted the United States lowers tariffs. A lot of Americans wanted the tariffs lowered. Well, Taft broke Roosevelt's advice and sent a tariff bill to Congress. The problem was by the time Congress amended it and amended it and amended it more and changed this and changed that, the bill that came back to Taft was nothing like what Taft wanted. Every historian I've ever read said Taft should have vetoed it and said, no, this is not what I asked for. Instead, being non-combative and non-competitive, he said, well, this is what Congress has approved. I'll sign it. He signed it anyway. He called it the best tariff in history. Historians today call it the worst. I remember having my high school teacher say, you should never take something that's the worst and call it the best. But anyway, he allowed stuff to tariff issue really good. And... Um, 
Now, the one thing that we did right, he prosecuted more trust than Roosevelt did, but he's not giving credit for it. He also began to try to use the dollar. Instead of using military might, he was not a competitive man. Well, I've already written that down. He tried to use American money to get his way in Latin America. Our relations in Latin America have often been somewhat soiled and spotty. But anyway, um, he tried to use the dollar to get his way in Latin America. In the meantime, Roosevelt was getting new. Roosevelt, to make it appear like, well, to make it not appear like he was controlling Taft, Roosevelt went on a safari in Africa. While he was hunting game animals, Taft, he left Taft at home. And one person wrote to Roosevelt, hey, the man you put in charge is like little Bo Peep. He's under the haystack fast asleep. If any of you know Mother Goose Rhymes, that's not taught to this generation as much as it was to former generations. But anyway, <coughs> finally Roosevelt returned home and he was greeted with a big welcome and everybody said, hey, come back and take over, become president. The man you put in charge is not doing a good job. He can't handle the job. Well, it came time for the convention. Roosevelt said he would not run, but at the last minute, he also had also promised when he left office he would never run again. But at the last minute, he decided, my hat is in the rain. Oh, hey, I'm going after it. Well, in the meantime, Taft did to him what he had done four years before. Now, folks, this is something today's presidents can't do. Taft decided, as head of the party, who would be seated at the convention and who would not. So when it came time to seat the delegates, a Taft man here, a Taft man here, oh, let a Roosevelt man, and some old party person who's been loyal at all, let him in. He's a, I know, he's a rope, but he won't hurt us. A few Roosevelt men were let in. The rest of the delegates who were known to be Roosevelt delegates were not seated. Roosevelt hastened to Chicago to try to look after his interests, but too late, there was nothing to do. The convention steamrolled Taft back into nomination. Roosevelt made a speech, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not steal the nomination, thou shalt not steal the presidency. Then he quoted, We stand in Armageddon, we battle for the Lord. I mean, he's quoting the Bible. But actually, what he had done by promising not to run, he had given Taft a moral mandate, but whatever happened, Roosevelt went off and formed his own party, the Bull Moose Party. The Bull Moose Party only ran one time, ran him for president. Basically what Roosevelt did, he split the vote. The Bull Moose Party polled more votes than did Taft. But it was enough. The Democrats in the meantime, they met and they nominated Woodrow Wilson. Now, oh. Woodrow Wilson goes down in history as one of the great presidents. Um, I myself do not really think so, but I'll get into why in a little bit. But anyway, Roosevelt, uh, Wilson won by an electoral landslide owing to the fact the Republicans split their vote. Now, folk, I want to tell you something about voting for a third party. My advice is don't ever do it. If you have a good person running against the bad, but the good person is not quite good enough for you, and you vote for a third party, that is really, in a lot of cases, a vote for the bad person. In the case of the 1992 election, a man named Ross Perot took a lot of votes from George Bush and got Bill Clinton elected. And as I said, Ross Perot, by pulling votes from George Bush, he got Bill Clinton elected president. He got 16% of the vote, but that was the votes that George Bush needed to win. Um, 
And then the last, well, anyway, I'll leave it at that. But basically, people, the Republicans split their vote. Wilson won by 40% of the popular vote, like Abe Lincoln, a generation or two before, only got 40% of the popular vote, but won by electoral landslide. Now, Wilson. Wilson's father was a preacher, and it says, all right, now this, folk, you can find out, look at, by the way, Wilson had roots in Georgia. He was not born in, I forget where he was born, in Lake Virginia, but he grew up in Georgia, and his mother's home is not very far away from right here. My wife has pointed out to me, I can't tell you exactly where it is now, but he, he had his roots. He was the first Southern president to be elected in almost 100 years. His father was always telling him he was not good enough. His father was criticizing him constantly, and he grew up with what you might call a low self-image or low self-esteem. Now, a lot of the time, this can do two things to a man. It can either break him, or it can make him push to achieve. In Wilson's case, to make up for his feeling of inferiority, he pushed to achieve, and he achieved. He got to be a college professor. He was the only president we ever had with a PhD. He got himself a PhD, pushed himself to get a, uh, to become president. Now, folk, when I was in the fourth grade, we had a substitute teacher, and we came to the part that he became president of Princeton University, an Ivy League school. Show. This is what you can do if you put your mind to it. I've got to disagree with that. No. You can't always just put your mind to something. Now, I had a pupil when I said this one time, if you put your mind to it, Muhammad Ali believed that, but one day Muhammad Ali became old like the rest of us do, and he could no longer win his boxing matches and had to quit. Well, I heard of a championship runner one time where in his 20s could beat everybody else. He got to be 36 years old. He said, my mind is still willing, but the body cannot do what the mind tells it to do. Inevitable. So, but again, just because you choose to put your mind does not mean you're going to become president of Princeton necessarily. Only a few people can achieve that. But anyway, as president of Princeton, he got the faculty mad at him. They were glad to see him go. He went on to become <coughs> governor of New Jersey. As governor of New Jersey, he pushed for reform and got the people there upset at him, particularly the high ups. They were glad to see him nominated for president of the United States. Now, they believed uh, he was a dark horse. He was a relative unknown, even though, yes, he had been governor of New Jersey. But in those days, again, the convention chose a candidate. And here is a problem the Democratic Party had. Folk, if this sounds modern, the Democrats could not come up with a candidate who was free from either money scandal or sex scandal, except for Wilson. Wilson had no issues with either one. So they picked him, and then they thought, well, maybe we can control him. Well, I've recently read that the persons who put Napoleon in power believed they could control him, and once in office, he couldn't be controlled. Same with Hitler. The persons who helped promote Hitler thought that if we get him and we'll control him, he's a popular man, but uh, we can handle him. They couldn't handle him. Persons who put Wilson in power, once in power, he became his own man. He refused to take orders from his political bosses, like some of the other presidents had not at all so dumb, just wouldn't take orders from his political bosses, and a lot of the Democrats were sorry they elected him. Now, I must say this about Wilson, too. He was, his father was a preacher. He, he himself was very religious. He was also very much into evolution. It's a bad combination. I had a student sitting about, how can a person be a Christian and be an evolutionist, too? Each of you can answer that for yourself. Personally, I don't see how the two worldviews conflict. Evolution calls for kicking the lower man down and kicking him out so that the better persons can survive. Wilson looked down on the poor. He said the thing to do with a common worker, the blue collar, collar worker, is just give him a lot of work to keep him out of trouble, keep him busy and keep his mind occupied with his work. 
And one day when he was in France, folk, a young, poor-looking Vietnamese bellboy came up to him. A bellboy, you know, a servant, hotel worker. This Vietnamese bellboy was to beg Mr. Wilson to please help us get independence from France. Wilson wouldn't talk to him. This bellboy has turned out later to be Ho Chi Minh. My generation had to pay for that snub dearly with their blood. Ho Chi Minh, finding he could not get any sympathy from the American president, went to Moscow. Got sympathy from Lenin and Stalin. And led the only nation that has ever whipped the United States in a war, led Vietnam to victory against the United States. A lot of the blame, folks, goes to Wilson, who looked down with disdain on the... Riff Wilson was a strong racist. This is in your book now. He, he, he was very much pro-white, white supremacist. I mean, the facts are the facts. He was also a strong sexist. He was hard against giving women the right to vote until the 1916 election, when he saw that the political winds were leaning strongly toward giving women the right to vote. All of a sudden, he became a champion of giving women the right to vote because if he wouldn't have, he'd probably never been reelected. The 1916 election was decided by one electoral vote. 3,000 votes in a certain precinct could have changed the election against, moved the election against Wilson. Wilson had an easy time in 1912, not in 1916. All right, one of the things that Wilson did that made him appear great. Um, first thing he did, the uh, tariff. All right, he, pay, he got the Underwood Tariff. which was the lowest tariff in history. All right, fine. A lot of trade people would agree with that. Okay, this was something that other presidents would not do, was give, put down a low tariff because they realized they needed money. So to get the money that uh, the low tariff lost, Wilson then proposed an income tax. So for the first time in history, Congress passed the income tax Someone took it to court and the Supreme Court declared the income tax to be unconstitutional. Wilson got to work and got a constitutional amendment, the 16th I believe, that made the income tax legal. This was the last time, folks, that a Supreme Court decision was overturned by an amendment. It's been more than 100 years. That doesn't sound like checks and balances to me. Checks and balances means Supreme Court decisions should be overturned two or three times a year at least. But it's been more than 100 years since one of the decisions overturned. But the income tax, now at first the income tax was small and only affected the rich. Well, eventually though the income tax became bigger and affected more and more people and eventually the income tax is taken out of your pay before you get it. Now. That has been changed. New laws say that you can keep it if you want to. If you get a high return, that means that you've been loaning the government your money for no interest. Because supposedly the government gives you a $5,000 tax return. That means that you loaned the government $5,000 and they paid it back to you with no interest. So what should you do? Uh, if you've worked for some firms, I'm thinking about VIP care or Magic Ears, and, online tutoring of Chinese students. If you work for them, they won't take anything out of your pay. Be sure you put some money aside, and if you do that, the money will draw interest. If you put it in the bank, put some money aside in your bank, where it draws interest. Then when tax time comes, the government gives you a bill for 5,000, oh, I've got that in the bank. You can draw it out, pay your taxes. At this point, I always remember my dad, I mean, I once, Made a bunch of long distance phone calls. I called the operator, found out what it cost, $10. So I gave it to the dad. I said, here's the money. I made some long distance phone calls. So the operator says it's $10, here's the $10. A few weeks went by and dad got a big phone bill. Big phone bill. So $10 was a lot of money back then. He said, hey, I can't pay this, but for that, I gave you the money. He wound up paying it, of course. I mean, I paid my fair share. 
But uh, I was looking for a job, see, the reason. Again, long distance. Today, there are no such things as long distance phone calls. I call my sister on hire regularly, don't pay a dime. My kids call their cousins regularly.